to the last lecture, last discussion of uh, the uh, Saga of the Volsungs. Um, we've been working on this for a couple of weeks, and today is the today is the uh, today we're kind of like wrapping it up. And uh, as you, what, what are your what are your comments about it? How how does it feel? <laughs> what comes to your mind <laughs> thinking about it? About the last lecture. Yeah, about the entire saga. Is it complicated? Yes. Well, what are the what are the there are a lot of characters because we're covering several different generations and what happens to these these different generations. And uh, what what kinds of things uh, if if you think of in terms of themes what comes to your mind? What, uh, what, is, what is this saga trying to tell us, rather than just you know, present a random collection of happenings and serpent killings and battles and, and failed love affairs and fratricide and suicide and infanticide and killings and murders? And so what, what's, what, what is the saga? What, is, what are these stories trying to tell us? What is the overall idea here? Can we pinpoint anything? What, what just comes to your mind? It's, there are no right or wrong answers, obviously. Would it be a... Let me ask you a yes, no question. Is it romantic love? To a very tiny extent, <laughs> but mostly it's not. It's not really romantic love. People get, people get married to people they don't want to get married to. It's kind of like you know, what I'm, I'm told to do this, said to a girl, and uh, and then the girl has to go and marry whoever it is uh, because of the father's will. We have exceptions to this, so it's kind of like this juxtaposition of two different kinds of fathers, also different kinds of people, different kinds of mothers, different kinds of sisters and friends and so on. So we can basically, we can relatively easily, we can identify who the bad characters are, who are kind of like thoroughly bad, and uh, yet there are an awful lot of normal characters who are neither bad nor good thoroughly because they're humans. And there is this very human, human uh, trait throughout, kind of like the, the from the beginning of the saga to the end. Even though we're dealing with magical things like, like uh, gods and uh, supernatural things and shapeshifters and what have you, but yet the the theme is very, very human, in the sense that it's betrayal. It's uh, family relations. Those are very important. It's about revenge. If you are hurt, your honor requires that you go and do something about it, and don't just you know don't just sit there. Like uh, there are some. There is this one mother who says to his sons, "Your relative just got killed, and you're just sitting there. So you're supposed to go and fight against this." Is these are, um, this is also a very stratified society. We are looking at kings and princes and people who are well to do. And we, we are occasionally introduced to a ma servant or a maid or a thrall, uh, which refers to a slave or a serf. But, um, but mostly this is about this, this higher society, it's about the dynasty. And we have gotten to a point where um, where we still have we have Sigurd left. He's alive. Sigurd's son, and Sigurd is how did he become famous? He became famous kind of like in that world, world around. What did he do? <laughs> Sigurd killed the. Serpent, right? 
the serpent that is sometimes referred to as a dragon. Uh, remember Beowulf, the Beowulf killing the dragon. So here we have the same motif. We have a brave young man, and he's very young at the point. He he says to he says to Regin, who uh, kind of eggs him on to go and kill the dragon uh, or serpent. Uh, he tries to say, why are, you, why are you sending me? I'm a kid and um, a, a young, I'm, I'm barely beyond my childhood. And, and Regin says, well, you know, it's just like, you know, a garden variety of a snake. Not so. This was a giant snake, like meters and meters and meters long. And uh, Sigurd uh, is, is very brave. Sigurd is a Volsung. And that braveness, that honor, okay, I'm, I, I made a promise, I'm going to kill the serpent and uh, for, for Regin, because Regin was my foster father, right? Uh, you remember that fostering thing that, that children were sent to another person to be fostered uh, and, and given education there um, in, the, in that society among, you know, the, the higher levels of the society. And um, that was in order to, to build these connections, relationships between powerful people. So Sigurd uh, kills the dragon or serpent, giant serpent, who in this case also has a name. It's, do you remember? So he kills Fafnir. That's the, that's the, uh, that's what gives Sigurd his fame. Uh, he, he kills it. Uh, why does he kill it? Why does Regin want Sigurd to kill Fafnir? Uh, other than, you know, Regin is a power in himself. He, he's, he's a grown man, but he doesn't dare to go and kill Fafnir. He sends Sigurd there to kill it because he wants Fafnir's treasure, pos possessions, uh, treasure, the gold, the silver, all these these very expensive things that the hoard of the treasure that Fafnir is sleeping on or, you know, spending his all his days and nights on except when he goes to drink uh, to, the, to the water and that's when uh, he gets killed from the ditch underneath by Sigurd. And, uh, and then, of course, we, you know, we have these supernatural things. Sigurd eats, uh, drinks, uh, not purposefully, but, you know, puts his thumb into his mouth and gets, it, gets the dragon's blood into his, uh, his, uh, his own uh, bloodstream. And uh, he, he gets this ability to understand the language of the birds. So we have this other theme kind of like between nature and, uh, and humans, and uh, it, this kind of like this smooth connection, and, the, uh, and Sigurd learning the bird's language, or learning to understand it miraculously. The language of the birds is uh, important in the sense that it emphasizes one of these themes. It's probably one of the clearest, uh, clearest uh, indications that we have this theme of, uh, of nature being um, in constant connection with, with humans. And that's how it should be. So it's kind of, you know, we think about it from the ecological point of view and, and that's kind of, in a sense, it's kind of cool. They bring leaves that heal, heal um, wounds and, and, and so on. But they also use poisons to, to uh, kill people. Okay, so uh, we have gotten, uh, gotten so far in the story that Sigurd is, uh, is left of the Volsungs, and uh, here we have Sigurd meeting Brunhild. Um, Brunhild is the daughter of King Budli, and um, King Budli has, uh, has other children as well. Uh, some are mentioned, a couple are mentioned in the story. Brunhild's brother is Atli, 
Otley becomes a major character towards the end of the story because Otley is, Otley marries Gudrun, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, but what is important about Otley is that uh, Otley is hypothesized to be, to be uh, Attila the Hun. And uh, this is a his historical character. It kind of places this whole story in that historical era. But it, what is interesting is that you find Otley um, as, as, you know, as part of this legend. Um, also, what is happening towards the end of the, king, uh, the, the saga of the Volsungs um, is that um, we're kind of like moving from myth to legend because Sigurd becomes this, in a way, in a way, like a Christ-like figure, not like Christ because he's extremely human, uh, and, and we see how human he is, like in terms of his romantic relations, um, is, uh, is not very substantial, but he is, there's an entire chapter here in the book that is dedicated to describing Sigurd, and he's described in extremely laudative, laudatory terms, that he's, he's, he's handsome, he's tall, he's got broad shoulders, so that, you know, he looks like, you know, the, the two men's shoulders are combined in, in his, he's so, uh, he's so strong, and he's even stronger than what he looks like, and his eyes are extremely bright, so that when he looks at you, you kind of want to avert your, your gaze because it's so piercing, his eyes are so piercing, so, you know, he's, he's made to, into this kind of like supernaturally strong person, and, um, and that's, that's kind of like approaching a legend where you take where you take like a saint and make a saint really kind of like uh, lift it up. And, um, and it's not uh, without consequences in the, in the cultures. The Saga of the Volsungs has had a lot of cultural influence. We have mentioned recent cultural influences like uh, in music um, and of course in, in, in art. If you just Google, um, the saga of the Volsung's images, you get a lot of, lot of stuff from, from various different kinds of genres of art. But music, we started the discussion of, of the saga of the Volsung's by listening to a little piece of uh, Richard Wagner's uh, Ring Cycle, the uh, Ride of the Val Valkyries, the Fight of the uh, Valkyries. And, and uh, it, it's, it's just been extremely influential, but back to Sigurd as a saint-like figure. Sigurd, because Sigurd killed a serpent or a dragon, that has, uh, has been picked up as a, as a symbol, a religious symbol. And in Scandinavia, especially in Norway, you still have a few of these churches left where on the portals of the churches, you have pictures of Sigurd, the dragon killer. And uh, so he has become like this, you know, saint-like figure. Hence, the idea that that the the the, the Sigurd uh, uh, sequence in the Saga of the Volsungs is uh, kind of, you know, like a legend. Okay, so Sigurd meets Brunhild, who has a son, Atli, who has a historical connection to Attila the Hun. Um, Brunhild has a uh, sister whose name is Beckhild, um, and uh, Hild is, is, as you probably noticed, that that's a common suffix, common ending, common part of female names. Uh, Brunhild, battle, uh, Hild meaning battle, and, uh, and here we have Beckhild also has that uh, same, same Hild ending, and then we will soon meet Grimhild, who also has the, has the Hild as part of her name. So it's a, it's a female name. So um, 
anyway. Uh, so after Sigurd kills the dragon, the snake, Fafnir, um, he also kills Regin, who is the one who wanted uh, Fafnir's treasure. And this is part of the treasure, this under, this, the, the human greed is also part of the story. Uh, Sigurd has been told, he has heard, that having this treasure is not going to, you know, do me any good. It's going to be kind of like a curse. But he overlooks that and he goes and loads the entire treasure after having killed Regan. So it's the, the treasure is in his now. And he loads his horse and he, he uh, takes, the, takes the treasure um, with him. Uh, on his travels, it's, it's unclear where he's going initially, but on his travels, he uh, accidentally meets Brunhild, who is like this sleeping beauty, uh, sleeping, uh, she's a female warrior, probably a Valkyrie, and uh, she is yet very human, also extremely human. and. Um, and uh, so uh, he uh, runs into Sigurd is now at this point he's, oh, he's of course he's proud of the fact that he's killed the serpent so he adorns his, his clothing with the, the patches, the signs of the dragon that he is Sigurd the dragon killer so there's this very human trait uh, to Sigurd as well legendary as he then be became so um, so, so he runs into Brunhild, who is uh, uh, dressed in uh, in battle gear. She has a very tight uh, coat of mail that it seems to have grown into her flesh. And so Sigurd goes, and so he's totally sleeping because he has his, she's she's under some kind of a spell, like the Sleeping Beauty. But uh, Sigurd first thinks that it's a soldier, but notices that she's a woman. And not only a woman, but an extremely beautiful woman. So, um, so uh, it's, it is like love at first sight. This is as romantic as, uh, as the story can get. Uh, it, it's no, it's, it, this is the most romantic. That's why I put this little, little heart here. They never marry but they end up having a child together, a daughter together. Uh, at some point, it's, there's, it's, it's unclear when that happens, but anyway. So uh, they don't get married, but they promise they make, they give vows to each other. Brunhild is not only beautiful, but she has other qualities that are extremely laudable. Uh, she is wise and she, she uh, goes uh, and you know uh, cites this old explanation of different different runes and um, and uh, and uh, what you can do with different kinds of runes and uh, and so she's educated and all the good things. Uh, she's a warrior. She's a strong woman, not just not just beautiful. So. Uh, all those positive features that kind of uh, appear in her. So Sigurd uh, very carefully uh, cuts uh, her mail open so that uh, she can breathe and, and she offers him wine. Uh, Brunhild filled a goblet, gave it to Sigurd and spoke and then beer I give you battlefield ruler with strength blended and with much glory. So she's very eloquent, eloquent as well and talks about these different kinds of runes for different purposes. And that's on pages 67 to 71. Uh, after that, she goes on and uh, gives wise counsel to Sigurd, uh, Sigurd says, this is uh, chapter 22, Sigurd said, never can, th can there be found a wiser woman in the world than you. Give me more wise counsel. And Brunhild goes, goes on and says, uh, says uh, 
these wise uh, pieces of advice that are you know still kind of like good for <laughs> good for the for the future centuries so she says do well on page 71 do well by your kinsmen and take little revenge for their wrongdoings so kinsmen the family that is a strong thing to be to be a strong theme to be taken away from this this uh, this saga so endure with uh, patience patience and you will win long lasting praise another good quality patience beware of ill dealings both of a maid's love and a man's wife ill often arises from these so be wise in in love affairs control your temper with foolish men at crowded gatherings for they frequently speak worse than they know controlling your temper important characteristic when but then she says when you are called a coward people may think that you are rightfully named so kill the man another day rewarding him for his malicious words so this is uh, be kind but kill if you are called a coward uh, be patient but be, don't be patient if somebody calls you a coward so here we have this bravery that is it is a characteristic that kind of raises above everything else and, and pride pride and bravery and uh, and the loathing of coward cowardice so uh, so she gives these, these pieces of advice that actually is quite a common thing in, in Nordic mythology and elsewhere as well, that, that you have like a story and the entire story is interrupted because someone is giving advice, <laughs> listing all these things. These, these stories are used for people's uh, informal education also, that they, they pick, up the, pick up the things that the particular culture wants to uh, emphasize. Okay, so um, so uh, back to the names uh, just briefly. Hild meaning battle and Brune is male cult. The, you know, the, uh, the uh, iron cult that, that knights wear. So uh, Brunhild is like her name. She goes to the battles wearing a male coat uh, and, uh, and is extremely brave. Uh, Beck Hild, uh, Beck means like bench. So this is a bench battle person and uh, name is a kind of a predictor there. There's this uh, Latin saying, nomen es omen, the name is an omen. It give, kind of determines what kind of a person you are, and Beckhill is someone who is extremely good at needlework and she likes to stay inside and sit on benches and doing, doing needlework. Um, so these two are sisters, Brunhild and Beckhill. Beckhill married to Hamir, uh, seems like a, uh, like a pretty good character. They have a son whose name is Alsvid. And, uh, and Sigurd ends up going just, you know, uh, after he has met Brunhild and they're kind of like really smit smitten with each other. And, uh, and uh, Brunhild says, uh, you are the kind of a man, I will only marry a brave man. And you would be the kind I would agree to marry um, if I were to marry. And Sigurd is also that I, I really uh, want, want you. On page 71, Sigurd said, no one is wiser than you, and I swear that I shall marry you, for you are to my liking. She replied, Brunhild replied, I would most prefer to marry you, even should I choose from among all men. And this they pledged with vows between them. So there's that little part between these two. And uh, yet, it's, it doesn't. This story doesn't have a happy ending. Their, their love story does not have a happy ending. Uh, so we have uh, on, uh, the uh, twenty-three. 
uh, the chapter concerning Sigurd's appearance. So here is, it, this is like praise for how wonderful he looked and what a, what a really perfect man he was. And so he's tall, he's got, the, he's got his, his uh, sword, which has a name, Grum, and, uh, and he's so tall that, the, that the, when he has his, his uh, sword on his, uh, on his head, it doesn't even uh, touch the ground. So it's, it, it, it just goes on and on about how wonderful he is. And, uh, and then he, he leaves, you know, after they, they really love at first sight, he leaves Brunhild. And he continues his journey with his load of treasure with him. So it's kind of like this burden that he's dragging with him. And he ends up going to Hymir's place, to King Woodley's place. And, uh, and it is unclear that the story doesn't really make it clear whether he knows that this is Brunhild's kin, Brunhild's people. Uh, and he goes there and, and he's invited because everybody's, the young guys uh, like Beckhilds and Hamir's uh, son, they're playing outside and doing games like young men do. I don't know what kinds of games they play, but anyway, they uh, see Sigurd coming and they, they first think that it's a god that is coming because he looked so wonderful. And uh, yet, uh, you know, and, you know, dragging this treasure behind the horse and uh, his horse, uh, which is a famous big horse, and uh, he is welcomed uh, very warmly and they ask him to stay there and he does and, uh, and they, he plays games with the guys and, uh, and has, a, has a good time. So um, what happens? Next is um, Brunhild comes there as well. This is after all, you know, his sister's husband's home, and even though he, she's been fostered elsewhere, um, she uh, comes there and is in this kind of tower room and Sigurd sees her there. And Brunhild is good at needlework too. So not only his, uh, her, uh, her sister Beckhild, but Brunhild also knows how to do that in addition to killing men, you know, in battle and, uh, and being wise in giving advice and knowing about the rules and so on. So Sigurd sees her and, she, and he kind of doesn't believe his eyes and so he's like, uh, This is on page 74. Sigurd answered, Good friend, listen to what is on, your on, on my mind. My hawk flew to a tower, and when I captured him, I saw a beautiful woman. She sat at the golden tapestry and embroidered there my past deeds. My past deeds. So Brunhild is thinking about uh, Sigurd con constantly. And Alsvid says, Alsvid is like Brunhild's sister's son. So Brunhild is Alsvid's uh, aunt, must be older than, well, who knows. Uh, so Alsvid replied, you have seen Brunhild, the daughter of Budli, a woman of most noble bearing. And Sigurd is like, that must certainly be so. When did she get here? And Alsvid said, there was only a short time between your arrivals. Sigurd says, this is, this I learned just a few days ago. This woman seemed to be, seemed to me the best in the world. So he is in love with Brunhild. Brunhild is now there. There shouldn't be anything to keep them from, you know, getting together. But uh, actually it's Brunhild who, wants to delay that and uh, so Sigurd goes to see her and Brunhild, uh, uh, yes, and Sigurd says, this is on page 74, the second uh, paragraph, Sigurd says, the best day for us would be when we can enjoy each other, Brunhild said, 
It is not fated that we should live together. I am a shield maiden. This is a hint that she's a Valkyrie. I'm a shield maiden. I wear a helmet and ride with the warrior kings. I must support them, and I am not averse to fighting. Sigurd, said, Sigurd says, our lives will be most fruitful if spent together. If we do not live together, the grief will be harder to endure than a sharp weapon. Brunhild says, I must review the troops of warriors, and you will marry Gudrun, the daughter of Gyuki. Here we come to another important family. And uh, so Brunhild also has these abilities of foreseeing the future. And a lot of the women in the entire saga of the Walsham state have these predictive abilities that they have a dream which they want to interpret or that can be interpreted and that will actually then happen. So Brunhild uh, refuses to you know, leave her leave her warrior career and get married with Sigurd. And we will see that very soon Sigurd will literally forget about Brunhild for a while at least. And how that happens is through some kind of magic also. Um, so, so Sigurd continues his, his journey. He goes to meet uh, King Gyuki, and um, there is this prediction. Sigurd uh, thanked her, Brunhild, for her words and gave her a gold ring. They swore their oaths anew. So they depart, but they swear the oaths. Even though Brunhild is saying, you're going to marry, marry somebody else, and Gudrun and Brunhild uh, knew each other also. So he went away to his men and was with them for a time, uh, prospering greatly, greatly. So, okay. So, uh, 26, uh, there was a king named Gyuki, whose kingdom was south of the Rhine. Now, Rhine is the river in, uh, in most, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, today's, uh, today's Germany. So we are in, in Europe. He, uh, Gyuki had three sons, Gunnar, Hogni, and Guttorm. Uh, these appear much more, and Guttorm is, uh, is given the task in the saga, uh, a kind of like a nasty task of, uh, of killing Sigurd, but anyway, uh, not yet. <laughs> so uh, Gunnar and Hogni are the main, of, main two of the sons. And, uh, he has also a daughter, uh, Gudrun, and this Gudrun is the one that Brunhild, uh, Brunhild predicted that Sigurd will not marry and not her, even though they end up having a, having a daughter together. So, um, so uh, this is um, this is a, another very important family. And in this case, uh, I mentioned the magic that the women often kind of show. So uh, Gyuki is married to another Hild, Grimhild, Grim meaning what it means, so Grimhild, and, uh, and she's a Grim figure. So uh, she, she knows magic and, uh, and uses the magic to her advantage to kind of, you know, uh, get to the goals that she wants to get to. So uh, Grimhild is a woman well versed in magic. Grimhild, the, the mother of Gunnar, Hogni, Guttorm, and Gudrun. And uh, this is where, where, um, where Sigurd goes. And uh, Gudrun is someone who also has these dreams she has, she has dreams and they make her like about horrible thing happen, things happening and uh, they make her depressed and sad. 
So what she does is she goes to Brunhild, who is her friend, um, so to say, and she tells about these dreams and Brunhild then interprets Gudrun's dreams. So we have women who have dreams and other women who interpret these dreams. And sadly about this, uh, this whole dream that Gudrun had, it turns out that Brunhild understands that this is the this is the realization of what she already saw that Sigurd is going to marry Gudrun and uh, and she will lose him and um, and that's what ends up happening so Sigurd uh, now rode away from uh, King Woodley's place and uh, <laughs> with uh, this is uh, 28. Sigurd now, now rode away with that mass of gold, leaving his companions uh, in friendship. So there were a lot of young men, and they had, had a good time. With all his armor and burden, burden, uh, a little bit of a metaphor, he rode a grani, grani is his magic horse, traveling until he came to the hall of King Giuki. So he goes there. He rode into the fortress. One of the king's men saw him and said, I think that one of the gods is coming here. They also thought that he looked extraordinarily godlike. This man is all equipped in gold. His horse is far larger than others, and his weaponry is exceptionally fine. He is far above other men, and he himself surpasses other men. So they ask who he is, and he tells who he is, and he's welcome there. And um, yet there is this green person, Greenhild there, king's uh, uh, wife, the queen. Greenhild perceived how much Sigurd loved Brunhild, and how often he mentioned her. So S Sigurd is totally smitten by Brunhild, and now they are apart. Uh, but Grimhild thought it would be more fortunate if he settled there and married the daughter of King Giuki, her own daughter. So Grimhild, this is an idea that comes from Grimhild that uh, she wants Gudrun to be Sigurd's wife. And what she does is a little bit of magic, uh, she uh, gives a uh, gives a drink to Sigurd that makes uh, makes him forget makes him forget Brunhild. So one evening when they sat together drinking, the Queen Rose, Queen Brunhild Rose, uh, went to Sigurd and said to him, "It's a great joy for us that you are here." And we wish to set all good things before you take the horn and drink. You know, they used horns, as cow horns and animal horns as, as cups. And, uh, and Sigurd accepted the drink and drank, uh, the horn and drank from it. And uh, she says, Grimhild says, King Yuki shall be your father and I your mother while Gunnar and Hogni and all who swear the oath shall be your brothers, then your equal will not be found. And again, of course, you know, these are kings, so, so they, want, they want Sigurd to be affiliated with them, especially uh, Grimhild has her daughter, uses her daughter as a pawn again for that. Um, this is uh, a very interesting relationship. Uh, Sigurd and, and Gudrun then get married because uh, as uh, on the very top of, of page 79, uh, Sigurd received this well and because of that drink he could not remember Brunhild. Um, so, you know, just a little while ago he has given an oath, uh, sworn his eternal love, 
uh, to Brunhild. Brunhild ha has given a ring to Brunhild, and now he meets another woman who's, who's a good looking woman too, a beautiful woman. And there's really nothing bad at this point to be said about Gudrun, and, um, and uh, forgets Brunhild. And like, that's, that's how they are. You know, you can, you can trust an oath uh, necessarily. So, okay. So uh, Sigurd now wed Gudrun. And uh, they end up having, well, we have Gudrun and Sigurd. Sigurd get married. I've marked it here already. So they get married. And they end up having a son whose name is Sigmund. And whose father was Sigmund? Sigurd's father. Uh, he was a Volsung, so here we have little Sigmund, Sigmund Jr., and um, whose grandfather would have been Sigmund, except that he was dead already. And uh, there's a sad fate for the little Sigmund as well. So, um, so uh, now we have Sigurd and Gudrun married, and they seem to be an amicable couple. Um, they have this kid together, and, uh, and uh, clearly Sigurd cares about Gudrun, and Gudrun is infatuated by Sigurd, and we know that after Sigurd dies. Uh, but, um, but now we have Brunhild, he was kind of like, you know, dumped. And uh, then we have these handsome men by King Giuki and Grimhild, Gunnar and Hogni. Uh, Gunnar is, uh, we don't know, Hogni, they get, he, he has a wife later on in the, in the saga, but uh, Gunnar doesn't at this point at least. And Grimhild comes up with this idea that, okay, Gunnar, should marry Brunhild because Brunhild is another king's daughter. And that's her idea. But the problem is that Brunhild only wants to have Sigurd or a man. He has, she has clearly said that she's not going to marry anybody who is not great. And then there's this test that uh, you can marry me if you can pass the test. And we will see this is kind of like a theme that happens in other, in other of the myths that we'll be reading as well. You can, if you pass this test, then I'll be yours. Um, or you can get the girl. <laughs> so, uh, so Brunhild sets up her own test. Gunnar uh, goes to King Goodly and, uh, and uh, proposes. Uh, to Brunhild. Brunhild doesn't live there right now. He lives a little, little uh, further away. And she lives in a place where there is like this huge fire, like a ring of fire around her, her place. And the task is that the man who can ride through that ring of fire to Brunhild, she will marry that man. Okay, so uh, so uh, uh, King Goodly also also says, I mean, I mean, I'm not going to decide for my daughter. She she has this test that needs to be passed. So so let's see who can do who can do that. And interestingly, when Gunnar goes to King Goodly's place and then Brunhild's place in order to ask for you know to marry Brunhild, um, Sigmund who is now married to Gudrun, goes with him. So you got, you know, this young man going there, and Sigmund, uh, S uh, Sigurd, I'm sorry, Sigurd is, is also there. So Brunhild, uh, and Sigurd is still kind of like under this weird spell, he at least claims to be, <laughs> that he has forgotten about uh, Brunhild. So, uh, 
Okay, Gunnar wants to ride through this fire with his horse, but his horse refuses. And, uh, and then uh, he says, um, give me your horse to, to Sigurd, give me Grani, and I will, I will see if Grani will go through the fire or jump over it or what have you. And uh, so Sigurd loans his, uh, his uh, horse, Gunnar tries to go through the fire with Grani, Grani refuses to go. Okay, so what to do? Uh, Brunhild needs to be married, right? And, uh, and what, what Gunnar and Sigurd do is they resort to some magic and they shift shapes. So this has happened before. <laughs> Usually, you know, interesting things happen when you, know, you have to change shapes. So Gunnar now takes the shape of Sigurd and Sigurd takes the shape of Gunnar. And, Gun and Sigurd takes his own horse in the shape of Gunnar and the, his, his horse, the brave horse of a brave man, uh, jumps through the fire and the, you know, the flames go up, it's very dramatic. And uh, Sigurd gets there in the shape of Gunnar. Brunhild is there and she's a little bit suspicious, but this is the man, this is Gunnar looking person um, who has passed the test. So she needs to keep her word. And therefore, Brunhild and Gunnar get. Married, even though Brunhild doesn't know that, even though the man who passed the test was really Sigurd, the man he, she really loves. So it's it's complicated. It's a soap opera in a way. Yes. Um, whenever she gets back to the other king's um, place, does she realize who Sigurd is? She, Brunhild. Yes. 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 But he still can't work with her, right? Yeah, it, it because she was uh, he. It's interesting because it's not said. Okay, the spell is over now. But when she gets there, then he's kind of like he's kind of like oblivious to the thing that this is the woman that I really love. This is my first love. And uh, and he acts in a funny way. He's always Sigurd is now married to Gudrun, and they are living in the same household. And uh, Sigurd is always very polite to Brunhild, and you know, kind of like, but her heart is broken. And uh, and it, his heart does not seem to be broken at the same to the same extent. So I'm like, men. Sorry about this horrible <laughs> stereotype, but but uh, he doesn't seem to be. He's actually quite content with Gudrun, and um, Brunhild uh, is not happy with Gunnar. And then Brunhild uh, figures out they, 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 they the women both figure out that it was not actually. Gunnar, who passed the test, it was Sigurd in the disguise of Gunnar, under the shape-shifting magic. <laughs> so, so uh, that's kind of like out of the, uh, out of the open. But what do you do? You've got already, you've got you know kids together, and everybody is expecting that this is the configuration of the marriages. So it's 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 complicated, but it becomes more complicated when. When because Sigurd has that that treasure, and it becomes more complicated because these two dudes, Gunnar and Hogni, who are good Gudrun's brothers, they want Sigurd's Sigurd's uh, treasure, and so that's the curse of the of the the, the earthly <laughs> belongings, and uh, and they plot to kill him. Uh, actually, they send the third brother, Guttorm, to kill Sigurd. And Sigurd is in bed with Gudrun, and Guttorm goes there and just, you know, 
uh, shoves the sword into his side or his, you know, his body. And so Sigurd is there splashing blood over, over Gudrun who is sleeping next to her, to him. And so Gudrun knows exactly who the killer is and Gudrun knows his brother, his own brother. And he knows that his brother uh, wouldn't have done it unless he had been egged on by the probably older brothers, uh, Gunnar and, and Hogni. And Gunnar is, so they're her brothers and they killed her, her husband. So Sigurd is gone now. And um, they also kill the little three-year-old Sigmund. So that's kind of like the end of the Volsums there. And uh, yet the story doesn't end, it continues. And um, it's, uh, it's not getting any simpler, any less dramatic. Uh, we have Gudrun, who is now uh, heartbroken because the man her husband is dead, and uh, also her son and her brothers just say, oh, we'll give you some money, we'll give you some treasures to compensate for your husband and your son. I mean, that's the, the thinking, but Gudrun is like, you know, nothing can compensate for that. And she's, of course, she's right about that. Um, and uh, then we have Brunhild left, who is still married to Gunnar, but uh, doesn't love her, and Sigurd is now dead also. So before Sigurd is dead, Brunhild goes through this very deep uh, depression, and just, you know, like refuses to come out of her, her room, and uh, just sulks there, makes it clear to everybody that she wants Sigurd even though Sigurd is married to Gudrun. And, um, and, and so it's, um, it's kind of, you know, not a really good story. Um, a happy story. I mean, it's a great story, but it's not really a happy story. So Bernard's grief on the increases and then Sigurd gets killed by Gudrun's brothers. Okay. Um, Gudrun ends up marrying again. I mean, um, Gudrun actually ends up being married after Gunnar dies because he, he dies in a, in a battle as well. And uh, Gudrun ends up marrying. So, to keep this very soap opera ends up marrying Otley Brunhild's um, brother and uh, hates him. Um, and yet, uh, Gudrun is, uh, Gudrun is kind of like told by Grimhild, her mother, to marry, to get married with Atli. And Atli is a, is a king and, uh, and a good catch from the mother's point of view, but she is still mourning for her husband. And um, so, you know, we at the at the end we end up uh, with a situation where pretty much everybody gets killed. Um, mm -hmm. Atli, to uh, Gunnar, Hogni. Um, interestingly, Atli uh, ends up uh, ends up uh, killing them uh, in a battle when they go to attack him. Uh, no, Atli actually uh, invites them over, 
Gunnar and Homi over and uh, because they now have, after Sigurd has died, uh, Gudrun has the treasure and together actually it's kind of like, you know, uh, in Gunnar and Homi are in charge of that treasure. So, uh, so Atli, who is now married to Gudrun, has also access to the to the treasure, and Gunnar and Hogni want to go and you know go there. Atli invites them over. Everybody warns them it's going to end up badly, and it does end up badly. So Atli ends up killing Hogni by cutting his heart out. And not only his heart out, but also his thralls heart out. Gunnar is thrown into a snake pit. And there he plays a harp, kind of an instrument, because his hands are tied, he pay, pays the harp, kind of an instrument, with his toes, and keeps the snakes away from him by that kind of a magical thing. But, um, but uh, there's one, he is able to put all the other snakes into sleep, but one snake, one large uh, snake, doesn't fall asleep and he comes and, you know, uh, digs its way to Gunnar's heart and Gunnar dies too. But there are some some pictures, relics left of that particular part of the saga where Gunnar is playing, playing with his toes, he's playing the harp very well with his toes and uh, keeping kind of like the, the snakes away, but ends up dying also. So, um, so we have this guy's dead, and Gudrun is left alive, and she is, of course, extremely angry with Atli, her husband, who has killed her brothers. So we have this cycle of killing and people becoming <laughs> becoming grief-stricken and then uh, other people having to avenge um, their, their relatives and so on. So it, it goes on and on, this horrible cycle. And, uh, and interestingly, you know, we have more of these little dreams here before Gunnar and Hogni go to Atli's place. Uh, everybody tries to warn them, don't go there, that's going to be your end. And that turns out to be true. Uh, Hogni's wife also has a dream, and uh, her name is Kostera, and um, she has a dream that you shouldn't go there. But Hogni is just like, oh, you're just, you know, misinterpret uh, misinterpreting this dream uh, in a two kind of like bad way. It's just, you know, a normal thing that you are you are dreaming about. Um, so Hogni is captured. Um, and then after after Gunnar has died and Hogni has died, um, Gudrun and Atli have this conversation um, and this is 40. King Atli now thought that he had won a great victory by killing these and, and, and getting access to that, uh, you know, because they didn't have access to the treasure anymore because they were dead. And uh, he says to Gudrun, Gudrun, he said, now you have lost your brothers and you yourself brought it about. So <laughs> kind of like uh, blaming Gudrun for it. And she answered, Your, you delight in announcing these killings to me, but you may regret what happened when you experience what follows. The legacy that will endure the longest is undying cruelty. Things will never go well for you while I live. Um, so, uh, so they have this conversation about it. Um, and 
Gudrun says that I would I would tolerate I hate you but I tolerated living you with you as long as my you know brothers were alive, and uh, then they have this funeral feast. Gudrun says, can I at least have a funeral feast for my brothers? And they decide to have that. This has happened earlier also, and bad things happened at that as well. So, um, so what Gudrun does, she is devastated because of the death of her brothers and earlier by the death of Sigurd. She's married to a cruel man, Atli, and uh, what she decides to do is um, he kills her own sons. Um, so she, she, she kills her own sons. Uh, so Atli, King Atli and Gudrun had, uh, had two boys and uh, she goes and slits their throats because she wants to avenge Gunnar's and Hogni's deaths to Atli. So, um, so she kills the sons and uh, just tells uh, Atli that um, I, uh, now, I shall, uh, now you shall hear what I have to tell you. You have lost yourself, because Atli is like, where are the boys? And uh, Gudrun says, um, I will tell you and gladden your heart. You caused my, me heavy sorrow when you killed my brothers. Now you shall hear what I have to tell you. You have lost your sons. On the table, both their skulls are serving as cups, and you yourself drank their blood mixed with wine. Then I took their hearts and roasted them on a spit, and you are, and you ate them. So King Atli says, you know, you cruel murderer, you murdered your sons and made me eat their flesh. So it is kind of, you know, kind of uh, cruel. Uh, well, not kind of cruel, of course it is, but this is kind of like the, the uh, underscores this, this horrible, this cycle of violence that goes on and goes on because of revenge, because of this cultural habit of so-called honor that if somebody does something bad for me, um, I will, I will um, have to avenge. Now, um, uh, it continues, the story continues by Gudrun then marrying a third, getting married a third time. She tries to commit suicide by going into the water, but the waves come and take her to a faraway place where there's a king who marries her, and that king, uh, king is Jonar, Jonark, Jonark, and uh, that's her, her third marriage. And uh, she, of course, has uh, sons with, uh, him as well, who are in that same, you know, killing kind of a cycle. So uh, Gudrun uh, also has, Gudrun and Sigurd had this daughter, Svanhild, and um, Sigmund, uh, the little Sigmund, got killed, and Svanhild lives to be an adult, but uh, also gets killed. So Gudrun has uh, Svanhild, her and Sigurd son with her when she marries this evidently a good guy, <laughs> Jon Arker, and, um, and uh, they want to marry uh, marry Swanhild. Swanhild is ra raised at their place, but um, there's another king who wants to marry Swanhild, so this continues. So, uh, wants to marry S Swanhild, but this king is old, very old, and he shrewdly sends his younger son to get to propose to uh, King Jonarker, and um, and uh, they say, okay, this king is you know a respectable person. Why not? gives Swanhild to him uh, in marriage and they start going there but the son who is with 
who is there to uh, to take care of this piece of business uh, falls in love with Swan Hill because I mean Skudrun's and Sigurd's daughter, obviously very beautiful, and uh, so the king's son falls in love with her, and she falls in love with him. And, uh, and then somebody tattles on them to the king and says, you know, they, they are in love with each other, and even though she's coming here, she's not going to be marrying you, old man. And, and uh, the king, king gets angry and uh, uh, ends up killing Swanhild. So there goes another ball. So Sigmund is dead, Swanhild is dead. So that's kind of like the end of that. And this this continuous cycle of revenge uh, continues. So let's get to the very very end. Also, these uh, Gudrun has other sons with uh, with the third husband, the king, and uh, they end up you know killing their brother and end up getting killed. So everything is just you know kind of. Uh, pretty horrible. So the last uh, page, 109, uh, the last paragraph, in the action the brothers had not dissolved, uh, Gudrun's and the king's uh, children, the brothers had not observed their mother's wishes that they had used uh, stones to wound. The mother had, they had these pieces of advice, don't do this, don't do that, and they, they didn't obey her. Now men attacked them but they defended themselves bravely and well, killing many of the attackers. This is always, you know, part of the first, they're doing very well. Iron was of no avail against the brothers. Then a one-eyed man, tall and ancient, came up and said, you are not wise if you do not know how to kill these men. So that was again, Odin making his last appearance in the, sa in the saga of the Volsungs, uh, giving advice. You're not wise if you do not know how to kill these men. And uh, King Jormunbrek answered, advise us if you can. And this old man, one-eyed man said, you should stone them to death. Thus it was done, and from all directions stones flew at them. So ended the lives of Hambir and Sorli. And these were good rooms and the, uh, the king's uh, sons. So that's how the saga ends, by, uh, by the two young men being, being killed. Um, violence, family pride, revenge, avenge, um, are clear themes here. And, um, and, and the, the, the whole idea that uh, bad things happen if people get kind of like focused on the wrong ideas, like the treasures and, and so on. OK, thank you. We will continue with the Icelandic sagas. Um, this is written down, down by an Icelandic person, but um, on Tuesday we'll have the test, and uh, that will be online on the platform. OK, bye.